a very yes, good morning. A very good morning to one and all of you. Let's start this very significant award session, the Young Researchers Award 2021. We have amidst us very prolific doctors on the panel, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev, our immediate past president, a glorious president in the last year chairing this session. We have with us our vice president, Dr. Lalit, as the co-chair, our honorary secretary, AIOS, Dr. Namrita Sharma as the convener and editor IJO as our co-convener. We have with us our eminent ARC panel, the very strong uh, panel of mine, Dr. Harshul Thak, Dr. Srinivas Joshi, Dr. Rohit Saxena, Dr. Satyajit Sina, and Dr. Anaga Haru. We have an array of most exclusive clan of ophthalmologists who have honored us today by accepting to judge this very prestigious session. Dr. Kuresh Maskadi, Dr. Harsh Kumar, Dr. Sunita Dubey, Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharya, Dr. Malika Goel, Dr. Subhash Zadia, Dr. Shobit Chavla, Dr. Giridhar, Dr. Arshad Siddiq, Dr. R.K. Bansal, Dr. Vibhuti, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Gopal Raju, Dr. Sudhir, Dr. Shikha Basi, and Dr. Gopal Arara. Thank you, one and all of you. We actually went through 96 submissions and had 515 top evaluators narrowing down to 12 finalists. I'm sure each of the submissions have great content. It's indeed a proud moment to have young speakers amidst us. And we look forward to all of you judges doing great justice to them and the presentations being of top quality. The time allotted for each speaker is four minutes and two minutes is only allotted for discussion. Huge constraint of time. I want my judges to be so brief to the point so that I can allow two judges to ask each speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Saumya who will be making her thesis presentation Serum and aqueous melatonin levels in myopes and its relation to sun's exposure. You can share your screen, Dr. Saumya. The other speakers also, as I introduce you all, please share the screen so that we don't waste time on that. I would want Dr. Shikha and Dr. Kuresh Maskati to comment on this after it gets over. Is Dr. Shikha there? Dr. Kuresh? There, there. Okay, okay, done. Okay. You can start, Dr. Soumya. A very good morning to one and all. I'm Dr. Soumya, presenting my thesis titles, Serum and Aqueous Melatonin Levels in Myopes and its relation to sun exposure. I have no financial interest to disclose. A linkage has been shown between quantitative assessment of ocular ultraviolet exposure and myopia. However, the role of circadian rhythm dependent on melatonin levels has never been studied before and its relationship to ocular ultraviolet exposure needs to be explored. Hence, the current study was done to study the association of serum melatonin levels with degree of myopia in Indian population aged between 10 to 25 years. The current study was a cross-sectional comparative study done at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Participants included 60 myopes aged between 10 to 25 years and 60 age and sex matched immetros. Participants with any history of systemic disease or ocular comorbidities were excluded. After obtaining a written informed consent, a thorough clinical workup comprising of visual acuity, optical biometry, conjunctival autofluorescence ultraviolet photography was done. The area of autofluorescence was calculated using a image software. A detailed patient history comprising of demographic history, sun exposure history using the questionnaire, myopia risk factor history, sleep quality assessment using Pittsburgh sleep quality index, and outdoor activity log was done. A fasting morning blood sample was taken to quantify serum melatonin, and aqueous melatonin was quantified using aqueous sample taken during the ICL surgeries. The socio-demographic characteristics of both the groups were similar. However, the parents of myopes had a higher educational qualification as compared to MED groups. On examining the daily activity profile, we found that myopes spent a significantly higher amount of time spent uh, in reading, and also the prevalence of daytime sleepiness was significantly higher in myopes. Serum melatonin levels were significantly increased in myopes and more so in myopes with more than six diopter of myopia. This corresponded with lower sun exposure in myopes as calculated from objective conjunctival autofluorescence method or lifetime sun exposure questionnaire. 
Ceramelectomy also showed a positive correlation with axial length. The correlation coefficient was 0.38. Medium value of aqueous melatonin was 2.1 picogram per ml, and it did not show any statistical association between uh, refractive error, axial length, or age. To conclude, serum melatonin is raised in myopes, and its level is positively correlated with degree of myopia. Ultraviolet exposure is significantly less in myopes. Hence, this study establishes the link between quantitative assessment of ocular ultraviolet exposure as measured by conjunctival autofluorescence and biochemical alteration as measured by melatonin in myopes. Hence, lifestyle modification and knowledge about these deleterious effects will go a long way in development of strategies for prevention of myopia, which is a significant health, public health problem currently. Thank you. You're muted, Dr. Chitra. I would want Dr. Shikha to comment and then Dr. Kuresh, if time allows. Uh, a great study, uh, Soumya. Congratulations. I believe you've already presented it in this year's virtual ESCRS conference. And what you have done in this study is endorsed uh, the uh, findings of Stephanie et al. group who have published this in 2017. Yes. Both the things they have studied that the uh, myopia is associated with increased serum melatonin levels and also the conjunctival uh, UV exposure they have studied, it's inversely related to it. What I want to know is, uh, what is the age group? You know that melatonin uh, is zero at birth and it increases exponentially from two to three months to prepubertal age group. So it can be really variable. So uh, you're, you've compared, I think, 18 plus uh, minus four years. Uh, so uh, 10 to 25 years age group. So uh, uh, for comparing myopes and non-myopes, yes, uh, it's, 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 it's actually, if uh, you've taken more younger children in one age group and uh, uh, the other group has a little elderly children, since it increases exponentially, we need to be very, very, uh, strict about the uh, kind of children, uh, the age group that we've uh, taken in both the groups. Yeah, both the age groups were similar, 10 to 25 years. That's what I'm trying to say, that it's quite quite a wide thing. And the second thing is that it's it follows a circadian rhythm, right? Melatonin is not the, it's, it's not uh, throughout the day same uh, level. So at what time you have taken? So uh, there's a lot of variability. You have taken a single point, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. It was the same in all the participants. We took it between 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning and it was a fasting uh, morning blood sample taken after 8 hours of fasting. Yeah. So basically the study proves whatever you have kind of endorsed the same findings as Stephanie at all broke in its Indian eyes. That's what I can say. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, uh, Chitra, I just said a couple of comments. Yes. Yeah, one is again, I, I am aware of Stephanie's paper. So what uh, did you read this before you uh, started this study? And in what way are you uh, uh, differing from the study findings? So I have read that paper before starting my study. And uh, the main thing was that serum melatonin levels that we got was a little different from what they have uh, given. And it might be due to, because the study was conducted in Australia and ours was in India, the continents were different and sun exposure profile is different. So that can lead to a different in serum melatonin levels in both the groups. Uh, purely based on your study, uh, what would be the recommendation that you would give? So I would like to recommend uh, uh, increased sun exposure in young uh, children to, for prevention of um, myopia progression and occurrence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, judges, for a wonderful discussion. Our next speaker is Dr. Dr. Sohini Mandal to make her thesis award presentation on a prospective study to evaluate incidence and indicators for early detection of ethambutol toxicity. Dr. Sohini, you can share your screen. And I would want Dr. Shobit Chavla and Dr. Giridhar to briefly comment after she finishes her talk. I want the timer to show to all of us. It does is not visible. You could start, Dr. Soini. Uh -huh.
Good morning, one and all. Myself, Dr. Sonini Mandal, Senior Resident in RP Center Ames, and my PG thesis title is a prospective study to evaluate incidence and indicators for early detection of ethambutal toxicity. So to begin the story, in 2019, India notified 24 lakh tuberculosis patients with an estimated incidence of 199 per 1 lakh persons, accounting for about 26% of the global burden that possess a huge concern for the community. Ethambutol, an integral drug of ETT, has the additional risk of drug-related toxic optic neuropathy if not picked up early, can result in variable and often significant visual dysfunction. Thus, detection of visual impairment at an early and subclinical stage is critical. With the aim of elimination of TB by 2025, the RNTCP was revamped in 2016 with changes in the protocol for the management of TB cases. The three times a week regimen was changed to a daily regimen and was included both in the intensive and as well as the continuation phase. Therefore, greater duration and frequency of ethambutol administration is likely to be associated with higher incidence of subclinical damage, which brings us to the rationale of this study. The primary aim of our study was to evaluate incidence of toxic optic neuropathy in patients receiving ethambutol for six months on a daily basis, along with identification of early indicators of toxicity secondarily. It was a prospective observational study conducted at RP Center in collaboration with the Department of Pulmonology and DOT Center Ames, New Delhi. We had a mandate sample size of 50 TB patients. These ophthalmic evaluations were performed prior to starting ATT and thereafter every two months till six months of therapy. Parameters assessed were best corrected visual acuity, color vision, contrast sensitivity, Humphrey visual fields, pattern VER, and spectral domain OCT to evaluate peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer and macular ganglion cell inner plexiform layer thickness. We included newly and definitely diagnosed category 1 pulmonary or extrapulmonary tuberculosis patients aged more than 18 years who were advised treatment as per the new RNDCP guidelines. Of 50 patients enrolled in the study, the mean age was 36.4 years and the mean total body weight was 67 kg. Based on the weight, the mean daily dose of ethambutol administered was 17.5 mg per kg per day. None of the patients revealed any significant changes for BCVA, color vision, contrast sensitivity, and visual fields. Hence, the incidence of clinical ethambutol optic neuropathy in our study was less than 2%. The changes in VER latencies were statistically significant. However, the changes in the VER amplitudes were not significant. Loss of peripapillary RNFL thickness was statistically significant in all quadrants on consecutive follow-ups, and similar results were seen in GCIPL thickness in all sectors. Among 100 eyes, 46 eyes showed an increase in VER latency of more than two standard deviation, that is more than 125 millisecond at two months or four months follow-up, indicating subclinical toxicity. Thereafter, we compared the daily dose of ethambutol, mean and sector-wise GCIPL, mean and quadrant-wise RNFL thickness at six months between the eyes with and without subclinical toxicity. Patients who showed subclinical toxicity were on higher daily dose of ethambutol than those who did not. The group with subclinical toxicity was also found to have significantly reduced RNFL thickness in the temporal quadrant only and significantly decreased GCIPL thickness in the supranasal and inferonasal sector only as compared with the group without subclinical toxicity. To conclude, the incidence of clinical ethambutol optic neuropathy was less than 2% in our study with almost half patients showing subclinical damage in the form of increased VER latency. Patients receiving higher dose of ethambutol in the same weight band showed more subclinical damage, particularly involving the papillomacular bundle. Delayed VR latency was noted to be the indicator of subclinical I just want to inform the House about the recommendations regarding prevention of ethambutol-related blindness as issued by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare recently, primarily composed of three things to increase the awareness, identification of high-risk individuals, and baseline examination of the aforementioned population. At the outset, I would like to thank AIOS for providing me a platform to present my thesis. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Swaini. Could I have Dr. Shobit and Dr. Giridhar commenting? It's a very significant study. And uh, there have been two previous studies from Korean groups. One was presented in 2016 in Arvo and showed exactly the same findings. What is significant is her and one from the Calcutta group that was in 2021 only. That was a bigger sample size of 93 patients. The number of patients we see with late stage ethambutol toxicity, so the clinical application and scientific value of this uh, study is very relevant. With a simple device like RNFL, which is present in most of the clinics, 
uh, VEP pattern may not be there, but it definitely has a significant value. I would request Dr. Giridhar to give his comment now. Dr. Giridhar? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very much here. Uh, I would like to ask one or two questions. I mean, a nice study, very important study. Uh, personally, I felt the sample size is very small. I mean, uh, 50 patients in a disease like tuberculosis, especially in a tertiary referral center, I feel if you could have got a larger data, it would have been very, the impact would have been very significant. This is more of a pilot study, I would say. Number right. two is... Uh, now, when you see the subclinical changes, what are your take-home messages? I mean, uh, what do you conclude from this? What okay. are the take-home messages and what is the advice that you would like to give to ophthalmologists who are screening patients for atomical toxicity? So my take-home message will be that uh, since the new guidelines has been issued by the RNTCP, according to the guidelines that is issued by the WHO in 2016, which has increased the ethambutol dosing to a daily regimen, that too for both the intensive and continuation phase for six months. Oh, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. Based on the results of your study, what is what you would like to say? I'm not bothered about what the national so TB program tells. Yeah, clinical application. Uh, at both the physician level as well as the patient level, according to the physicians, the patient, the physician should see a large number of your patients had subclinical. Nearly half of them had uh, asymptomatic VEP changes, isn't it? Now, whether this sort of a change will, uh, with that, I think, is it necessary for us to advise physicians that these patients have got early changes, subclinical changes? and whether these patients, the dosage has to be reduced or any changes have to be made in the treatment. That's what I would like to know. Because the idea of screening is to detect a, a toxicity before it becomes manifest or causes visual loss. So when you see a subclinical change, what is the significance of that? I would like to. So the first, we have to identify whether the patient belongs to a high risk category or no, low risk category. If the patient belongs to a high risk category, then the patient is advised to uh, undergo baseline ophthalmic investigation such as color, contrast, visual acuity, visual fields, VER at baseline and after every two months of... No, you're not, you're not uh, anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Soini. You did your best. Our next speaker is Dr. Prateek Nishant to present on a prospective comparative study to evaluate the accuracy of vectorally analyzed iris photographs for objective assessment of ocular torsion in patients operated for cyclovertical strabismus. Uh, you should share your screen and I would want Dr. Subhash and Dr. Vibhuti to comment. Yes, you can start, Dr. Prateek. You uh, unmute yourself. For the diagnosis and measurement of ocular torsion, subjective and objective methods have been described. The latter include measurement of its fovea angle on fundus photographs, infrared photography of distinctive iris features, and recently the use of consumer grade DSLR camera equipment and personal computer software for capturing and analyzing pixel coordinates of iris landmarks. The gold standard of dysphobia angle measurement on fundus photography involves increased costs, time delay, and inconvenience in uncooperative children and hazy media. Head tilt correction has been done by several methods and image analysis by several software. Iris photography has been mostly described using video-based or monocular methods. There are limited studies in describing binocular iris photography for assessment of change in ocular torsion, and none of them in Indian eyes. Hence, the need for such a study was uh, felt to develop a simple low-cost technique for the purpose. The objectives were to measure change in ocular torsion by the two techniques, finding the accuracy of this measurement using the novel technique, and to develop a method of binocular iris photography using a DSLR camera for Indian eyes. This was a prospective comparative study with an experimental component conducted in 30 eyes of 15 patients over a year, and it was approved by the ethics committee. It included subjects over eight years of age with diagnosed cyclovertical strabismus and excluded those with ocular pathologies, hampering imaging, unwilling and uncooperative patients. 
the iris and fundus photographs were taken pre and post operatively and difference in protrusion compared and uh, uh, and determined the iris photographs were taken in forced primary position using dslr camera minimizing head tilt with the double axis spirit level the camera settings as shown in the table were found by experimentation central fundus photographs were taken using camera side marks to reduce head tilt the coral draw x3 software was used to calculate disc fovea angle freed pixel coordinates and iris landmarks and slope of lines joining the pupillary centers to these landmarks iris torsion angles were calculated using uh, microsoft excel spreadsheet uh, involving four iris landmarks the appropriate statistical tests were applied and these are the demographic details of our sample various types of cyclovertical strabismus were operated upon objective x cyclotropia was seen in 10 eyes and in cyclotropia in 5 eyes these are the pre and post operative photographs of a representative case the absolute difference in disc fovea angle and iris torsion angle were calculated and wilcoxon sign rank test showed that these were not statistically significant the difference between the two methods was also calculated these parameters were analyzed with measures of central tendency and dispersion mean difference mean difference uh, uh, between the two methods was minus 0.15 uh, degrees with a standard deviation of 0.9 Further analysis confirmed the normal distribution of the difference between the two methods. The Spearman's correlation coefficient was 0.85, implying strong correlation. The bland Altman analysis showed that most of the variations were between 95 limits of agreement. The two one-sided tests based on Welch T's test was done and showed equivalence of the two techniques with the gold standard. The residual head tilt remained less than one degree. Uh, binocular photography represents more a more physiological state of cyclofusion. However, the difficulty in vectorizing analyzing the iris pattern uh, has been recognized by previous researchers. The present study corroborates well with the initial report by Felix et al., uh, and it has been described that the settings uh, used were, was the uh, with an accuracy of uh, plus minus two degrees of the gold standard. Uh, this slight discrepancy is because the assumed center of the rotation is coincident with the pupillary center. But this is true when the camera's optical axis and the line of sight co coincide. The large gaze elders are unavoidable in strabismic patient even with advanced uh, uh, This is the first study of this kind in India. Thank you. Doctor, thank you very much. Dr. Subhash? Uh, thank Dr. you, Prasant, uh, for a new innovative technique. And I would like to congratulate you for describing this. Uh, the limitations in uh, large angle stabismus uh, are well known with this technique and it is an excellent study. Uh, Dr. Vibhuti? Pratik, just one point to be asked. Uh, uh, congratulations on this presentation. Uh, what were the lacunae when, when we are using this camera, SL, DSL ca camera for uh, capturing the photograph? Uh, what are the points which you want to highlight? Uh, where uh, lacunae can develop? So one of the most important lacunae which can develop and which can skew the results is the effect of the head tilt, which is very uh, much significant and has been uh, variously studied and uh, various methods have been applied uh, for the correction of this uh, problem. Actually, we used a double axis spirit level tape to the forehead of the subject. So the two levels, uh, the spirit levels, uh, uh, have to be observed that the bubble of the spirit level has to be between the uh, two lines, which ensures that the head of the subject is, uh, uh, you know, level with with the uh, uh, ground and not tilted. And also, you have to uh, ensure that the Frankfurt lines, that is the uh, line between the uh, ear and the lateral canthus, that has to be parallel to the floor. So basically, first uh, problem is uh, that of the head tilt. The other is that the settings have to be very specific so that uh, they are universally applied to the uh, Indian eyes because the irides are very dark. Any change in these settings is unlikely to produce the same result that uh, has been found in uh, the experimentation in our studies. And uh, 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 Chitra, can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, very brief, huh? I think. Yeah, just... uh, Pradeek, uh, uh, how does this, how is this superior to the standard, gold standard of fundus photography? And is the DSLR camera handheld or tripod held? Sir, the DSLR camera is tripod uh, mounted and it is slightly superior to the fundus photography because of the increased costs and need for matrices and the uh, the time delay which is caused. Also, in uncooperative patients, it is difficult to capture accurate fundus photographs. 
uh, which are fovea centric and uh, uh, which can be okay. analyzed fine, by the fine. computer software thank you very much you did very well is dr liz uh, mary santosh around yes our next yes. speaker is dr liz mary she is going to present on comparison share your screen present on comparison of myopic and glaucomatous eyes using oct angiography our judges are dr sunita dubey and dr harsh to comment good morning my thesis is titled comparison of myopic and glaucomatous eyes using optical coherence tomography angiography these are the fundus images of a 57 year old female with uh, high myopia having minus 6 and minus 7 diopters in her right and left eye respectively iop in both eyes were within normal limit the hfa showed a uh, superior arcuate scotoma in both eyes more in the right eye and oct rnfl showed thinning in both eyes does patients like this have glaucoma or is it just high myopia this is what my study aimed to answer the aim of my study was to evaluate the vascular density in the optic and optic disc and peripapillary region and macula in myopic and glaucomatous eyes using optical coherence tomography and geography in order to determine if the two diseases can be differentiated on the basis of vascular density opta as we all know is a novel non invasive technique of retinal vascular imaging and vessel morphology and vascular density can be assessed this was an observation comparative cross sectional study carried out between one year and included patients between the age of 40 to 60 years who were classified as primary open angle glaucoma high myopia and age match controls high myopia was defined as those with spherical equivalent more than or equal to minus 6 diopter sphere or primary open angle glaucoma was defined using the standard criteria and we had age match controls without evidence of glaucoma patients with high myopia with open angle glaucoma history of trauma or any other coexistent ocular pathology were ex excluded a comprehensive baseline evaluation was done and the patients were categorized into primary open angle glaucoma high myopia or controls and all the patients were subjected to oct angiography of the disc and peripapillary and macular region images were obtained from a 3 into 3 mm zone centered on the optic disc and a 3 into 3 mm zone at the macula centered at the fovea the images thus obtained was extracted and binarized using image j software which is a java based image processing system developed by the national institute of health these are the fundus images of a 60 year old uh, diagnosed with primary open angle glaucoma showing the disc and peripapillary and the macular region and the corresponding oct angiographic images on binarizing the images appears like this and the calculated peripapillary vascular density was 29.55 percentage and the macular vascular density was 14.75 percentage a total of 128 eyes of 70 patients were enrolled 48 belonging to the control group 46 to open angle glaucoma group and 34 belonging to high myopia group the table shows the distribution of the peripapillary vascular density and we can see that it has a decreasing trend from controls to the op primary open angle glaucoma group this is the box plot showing the distribution and on further analysis we found that the primary open angle glaucoma group had a lower peripapillary vascular density compared to the high myopia group and this was statistically significant the macular vascular density also showed a decreasing trend from controls to the open angle glaucoma group and on further analysis we found that though the open angle group had a lower macular vascular density compared to the high myopia group this was not statistically significant uh, relation of glandular cell complex thickness to macular and peripapillary vascular density showed a positive correlation to the peripapillary vascular density of open angle glaucoma group to summarize there is a significant difference in the peripapillary vascular density between the open angle glaucoma and high myopia group with the peripapillary vascular density of primary open angle glaucoma group being lower and there is no significant difference in the mean macular vascular density between open angle glaucoma and high myopia group to conclude the opta is a useful diagnostic tool and can be a potential aid in distinguishing between the two entities and the measurement of peripapillary vascular density has a greater discriminatory ability than the measurement of macular vascular density in differentiating the two the lack of an age appropriate normative data for comparison and was the limitation of my study these are my references thank you that was very good thank you mary thank you mary, thank you, mary. i think that was uh, wonderful uh, the way you presented very nice yeah uh, i have a question uh, see most Can of the studies uh, are you getting me yes ah, yes sir yes sir yeah. okay so most of the studies say that it is the macular areas which are more important and obviously i can see why because you have only taken a cube of 3 into 3 and mostly they say that it is the 3 into 3 cube which will not give you any results you have to have a 6 into 6 mm cube to get the idea of uh, the macular area which is the outer areas are more affected uh, sir uh, most of the studies are only conducted in glaucoma patients uh, none of the studies were uh, conducted in myopia patients 
Uh, and no, also, the Lee study has got both myopic and this thing, and they are trying to separate out both the things. And uh, I anyway, so I I think you had to do what you had to do because, but please do remember. It yes, is the yes. outer area from three to six millimeters, which is more important to catch. And that oh, is why yes. perhaps this uh, judgment is flawed because all those studies are showing that the outer macular areas are giving a better result differentiating myopia from glaucoma in myopic glaucometer size. Okay. Yes. Okay, Nita, sir. please go ahead. Yeah, so it's a very nice study uh, in the um, sense that uh, it is very uh, difficult to differentiate glaucoma and myopia clinically and even on OCT because uh, of the tilted disc and large parapapillary atrophy, it doesn't get affected. Uh, so OCT A doesn't get affected by all these factors. However, uh, OCT A gets affected very much by the motion artifacts and signal strength. So yes, you take care of that and how much signal strength did you take? Um, as a cutoff. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so how much signal strength did you take as a cutoff? Ma'am, we only took them, uh, um, took those with, without any image artifacts, ma'am. No, no, but there's a minimum signal strength which you have to take as a cutoff value, like seven or eight. Yeah, ma'am, seven. Seven. And yes. uh, Segmentation error. No, uh, only the sup uh, superficial vascular, um, uh, superficial va va vascular, uh, superficial capillary level was taken, ma'am. Which was pre. Uh, there, there is uh, slabbing is uh, present within the in, uh, instrument itself, ma'am. No, no, I'm not slabbing. Uh, I am just talking about. Okay, did you exclude uh, very high myopes with segmentation error on OCT? Um, uh, as uh, we didn't take any uh, images which which had a segmentation error. Only with the, the clear images which could be segmented. Only uh, which could uh, I mean which could uh, which could give the clarity clear images with the uh, Showing the superficial vascular. What is, uh, what is your recommendation? Should OCT A be, be recommended in patients with associated high myopia and glaucoma? Uh, we can do. Uh, we we can uh, recommend that, ma'am. Uh, and we can see that uh, based on the uh, we it uh, Octa will al always be an added tool in uh, um, helping us diagnose between the two uh, entities, ma'am. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You did well, uh, uh, Liz Mary. We go on to our next speaker, Afreen Bari, who would be presenting on comparison of three intravitreal antibiotic drug regimens in acute bacterial endophthalmitis. And the judges to comment would be Dr. Malika Goel and Dr. Gopal Arora. You could start, Dr. Afreen. Good morning, one and all present here. I'm Dr. Afreen, and I'll be presenting my thesis study on comparison of three intravitreal antibiotic drug regimens in endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis is the most feared complication by every surgeon, and its aggressive management is very important. Currently, we inject intravitreal antibiotics, vancomycin, and ceftazidim in cases of acute bacterial endophthalmitis. If there is worsening, we proceed with parsplenar vitrectomy. But studies have shown a rise in ceftazidim resistance. The ceftazidim, which is used, covers the gram-negative, gram-positive aerobes as well as anaerobes, but has shown 8 to 14 percent resistance. Other drugs like imipenem and tazobactam are less studied, but they have a better spectrum compared to ceftazidim. We studied various studies, which showed us that there was increase in cases of resistant bacterial endophthalmitis. The studies which showed us the microbiological profile of the bacterial endophthalmitis cases that were presenting to us. And uh, we also uh, saw studies which showed that advanced methods of culture and antibiotic sensitivity yielded higher positivity rates. Yes. And we realized that the lacuna was there was no study comparing the different antibiotic drug regimens in endophthalmitis. There was also paucity of literature suggesting alternative drugs for ceftazidim. So we decided to fill in the gap in medical literature about alternate drugs to ceftazidim and also add to literature about advanced mod modalities of diagnosis of positive agent and also study the pharmacokinetics. With this, we designed a study where the primary objective was comparison of different antibiotic drug regimens and also establish the micro microbiological profile of cases coming to the center and also study the pharmacokinetics of drug that we inject in vitreous in inflamed acute endophthalmitis eyes. 
So we designed a study where it, it was a prospective comparative study. We included 64 subjects in three antibiotic drug regimen groups. The first was septazidim and vancomycin. Second was tazobactam and vancomycin. And the third was imibenum and vancomycin. We included cases who were diagnosed with acute endophthalmitis above 18 years of age and willing to give consent. While we excluded patients who were diagnosed with fungal endophthalmitis or presented beyond 15 days of the inciting event or had intraocular foreign body or had any history of intramental injection outside the center. Coming to the results, the baseline characteristics of all the three regimens were comparable. Now coming to the clinical results. The main results were based on the improvement in vision in the three groups. Here we can see that all the three groups, the vision improved. However, by, if we compared them uh, statistically using the crystal valis test, there was no statistical difference between the three groups. The other results which we yielded were, if the patients presented early, less than three days of the onset of symptoms, they had a better final vision. And post-surgical cases, they also had better final final vision and improvement in vision as compared to post-traumatic cases. Coming to the microbiological results, Bactec and PCR yielded much higher positivity rates as compared to the conventional culture. In our study, the most common gram-positive bacteria was Coagulase negative Staphylococcus and the most common gram-negative bacteria was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Comparing, seeing the antibiotic sensitivity, which was done using Kirby Ward disc diffusion method, we saw the, that among the gram positive cases, two were resistant to vancomycin, and among the gram negative cases, they had a similar uh, resistant profile for the three drugs, septazidim, tazobactam, and imipenem. Coming to the pharmacokinetic results, we see that uh, at 48 hours, the post intravitreal injection, only vancomycin and ceftazidime had concentration more than the minimum inhibitory concentration. So the limitations of my study was the decision of vitrectomy was left to uh, was less uh, left to the surgeon to decide, and the rate of vitrectomy was very high in this study because that was because it was a tertiary care center. Overall, the positivity rate in Bactec was 30, just 36 percent. So that uh, significant. My recommendations were tazobactam and piperacillin and imipenem. They have good gram negative coverage, but depending on the superior ocular bioavailability and availability of the septazidim, we still recommended it a first line drug. However, a larger sample size should be uh, study with larger sample size should be done to conclude the superiority. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malika. Yeah. Um, uh, doctor, this was a very good study, uh, but you mentioned that the ocular bioavailability is higher for uh, uh, the ceftazidime, but uh, you're injecting intravitrally, right? Yes, ma'am. So then where is the question of bioavailability? I mean, it's, it's, it's relevant when you're giving systemically, then we can say that ocular bioavailability is higher. Uh, ma'am, uh, when at the time of vitrectomy or second injection, vitreous sample was again taken, and uh, before injection, and we had calculated that two days back the injection was given, how much was remaining in the sample? We can we calculated it using the uh, mass. You know, the, what you mean to say is half life is longer yes. for septazidine. Yes, ma'am. Bioavailability. Okay, so from your study, basically you did not find a significant advantage to using the other drugs over septazidine. Yes, so ma'am. Theoretically, the resistance has increased. But you did not find much difference between the, so, so you could possibly use the two. Um, yeah, I think there are. This is a good uh, alternative. But uh, I think there are other drugs. If if imipenem and tazobactam are not available, even fluoroquinolones have a reasonable activity on gram-negative organisms with very little toxicity. So if 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 these other two drugs are not easily available, those can be used. Um, and I think to club traumatic and surgical would be different because difficult because the organisms themselves are different for the two groups. So, but overall, it's a good study. Um, thank you. Dr. Gopal? Yeah, first of all, let me compliment Dr. Afrin for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my only point is, is final vision, should it be the criteria? Because it all depends on the severity of endophthalmitis, the corneal complications, and the duration at which it presents. That was the first point. And second, why there's a lot of studies which show that septicidium resistance in India is quite prevalent. So have you taken these two points into consideration? Sir, uh, according to the uh, samples which we had taken and uh, back, only six samples were there. 
which we had uh, taken for uh, seen for septazidim resistance and we had taken seen two cases were septazidim resistant so taking into that we had planned the study but however uh, we also saw that we also saw imipenem resistant cases and tazobactam piperacillin resistant cases so just depending initially we should not switch over to the higher antibiotics we found out with this study if if on culture we come to know that the organism is septazidim resistant then we may switch over to higher antibiotics thank you i think dr lalit has a question i suppose dr lalit Doctor, no, I am very, I am very happy with this study because a lot of uh, times we hear in a lot of webinars and uh, you see like shift to the higher generation, but this study has put to rest that septicemia still. Or I know 65 percent sensitivity is there with gram negative, but remember, uh, Arfin, the the main principle of management is to kill the bug, kill the bug. So half life, I don't consider. I may inject frequently, that's okay, but if I have to kill the bug. I have to kill the bug, so that is very very important. Thank you, doctor. Uh, uh, very good uh, uh, feedback. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Aman Kumar to talk on limited versus conventional internal limiting membrane peeling in macular hole surgery, the structural and functional outcome comparisons. I would request Dr. Lalit Verma to comment on it. Uh, thank you, ma'am. A very good morning to everyone. So the uh, title of my thesis uh, was "Limited versus Conventional Internal Limiting Membrane Peeling in Macular Hole Surgery: A Structural and Functional Outcome Comparison." So uh, we have no financial disclosure or proprietary interest. The purpose of our thesis was to analyze the structural and functional outcomes in patients with full thickness macular hole surgery using two different techniques of uh, BBG-assisted ILM peeling. That is. Conventional in one group and limited, that is sparing ILM over the papillary macular bundle in the second group. Uh, the, uh, the, the standard treatment nowadays for an idiopathic full thickness macular hole is a pass plane of vitrectomy, which is generally done to remove the anterior posterior traction uh, as described by GAS and ILM peeling, which reduces the tangential traction and also helps in glial cell proliferation and hence uh, leading to better uh, macular hole closure rates and subsequent vision gain. So ILM is conventionally peeled 360 degrees around the fovea after staining with a ILM specific dye. The papillomacular bundle uh, is a, a bundle of nerve fiber that carries the thickest nerve fibers from the fovea to the disc. So sparing, uh, we had a hypothesis that sparing ILM over the uh, papillomacular bundle would cause lesser damage to this area, and hence the inner retinal layers uh, in the present in this crucial zone. So the deficit in literature was uh, about the effect of tissue damage individually by the dye used. And the ILM peel done in the papillomacular bundle area. So the study duration was uh, one year. It was a prospective randomized interventional study. There were two groups of 15 patients each of idiopathic full thickness macular hole, and uh, the inclusion criteria had phacic or pseudophacic patients with uh, clear lens with stage three or stage four idiopathic full thickness macular hole, according to the GAS classification of size less than 400 microns. So this is the flowchart of the study designs in which. Uh, We randomized using uh, random generated numbers using uh, computer generated random number tables in two groups, and in 15 patients in the group A, underwent uh, total ILM peeling 360 degree around the fovea. And for the structural uh, assessment, we uh, went ahead with swept source OCT. And for the functional assessment, we got a multifocal ERG done, a ganglion cell analysis, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, and the central macular thickness. And this was repeated three months follow up after the surgery. This was done in both groups. So these are the standard maps which were used. This is the central macular thickness in which the ETDRS grid was used of 136 uh, millimeter, and the central macular thickness was uh, calculated. This is the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer in which superior nasal, inferior, and temporal quadrants were uh, measured, and uh, this is the ganglion cell analysis, analysis in which uh, six zones were there and individually compared in both the groups. And this is the multifocal ERG analysis in which uh, we got these four zones ar ar around the foveal area. So, just coming to the anatomy, this is the papillomacular bundle going from the fovea to the uh, uh, disc. So, this is the standard group in which generally a 360 degree ILM peeling is done. Uh, uh, this is one of our patients, and in, this is the group two in which only a temporal uh, ILM peeling was done, and the nasal papillomacular bundle area was spared. This is a uh, one of the uh, representative images of a pre-op and a post-op im uh, image showing uh, a type one closure. And so uh, I just wanted to say that in both the groups we had a hundred percent closure rate. 
that's signifying that both the in the whole size less than 400 microns it, uh, with an ilm peeling either uh, 360 degree or uh, pmb sparing there was the closure rate was same and the bcvi was also significant gain in both the groups they were um, we had 60% females in our group with a mean age of 65 there was no change in any choroidal thickness in both groups using uh, we measured it subjectively uh, with a swept source oct the nasal and temporal hemifield erg retinal response densities increased significantly in both the groups thus suggesting the macular hole closure rates leads to improved retinal function and this is uh, due to the realignment of the inner layers the bipolar cells and the uh, molar cell configuration and there is a decrease in the central macular thickness in both the groups and smallest reduction was seen in the nasal hemifield which in which the pmb was spared so rnfl uh, which was measured only significantly reduced in the temporal quadrant of group 1 patients thus concluding that the ilm peeling and not the bbg dye is the cause of the rnfl uh, th thickness loss also we showed that the lesser there is a lesser uh, ganglion cell uh, thickness which is damaged in the non ilm peeled region so just to summarize the limitations of our study was a smaller sample size and a shorter follow up duration and these functional changes could change over a longer post operative follow up and uh, ilm peeling does cause a significant structural damage but the epidemiology closure rates and the bcv gains were similar to the studies in the past thank you uh, you can stop stop sharing dr lalit uh, wonderful uh, contribution aman uh, to the literature but this was expected i think uh, there has been a lot of studies done that bbg is non toxic there a lot of studies independently done for bbg that bbg is not toxic so only thing which could have made a difference was the extent of ilm peel and but i would actually uh, do this study in a larger hole because less than 400 micron honestly speaking is hardly a hole in our setup because we hardly get in practice 400 micron we get 600 1000 2000 like type of holes and uh, in larger holes the things have shifted to flap rather than to to peel and uh, my question would be suppose you have a you know based on this does the patient uh, have, did you do contrast sensitivity by any chance apart from uh, these tests no sir we didn't do contrast sensitivity for functional analysis we only did rnfl and gc and erg because these are these are theoretical tests which uh, you make the patient aware but by and large patient does does the patient in two groups uh, you know complain differently because you had a phenomenal success rate of 100% in both the groups so, so did the structure have any subjective this thing by dr sab isme acha nahi hai isme zyada acha hai or whatever no sir so structurally the and by the patient's symptoms also it was uh, no significant difference in both the groups and the second question was based on your results suppose uh, you have to do a macular surgery in my eye will you will you for a 300 micron hole you will do only temporal or you will do complete sir if there a hole is size is less than 400 microns then uh, ilm peeling in the That's temporal complete. quadrant also showed similar results like 360 uh, compared to 360 degree so i'll go ahead with only temporal peeling sir so that means in less than hole you advocate that nasal should not papular macular bundle should not be touched at all yes that sir is... because it does cause damage to the inner retinal layers okay good good control lalit uh, lalit can i just sit up one or two yes one here uh, yes. lalit one actually uh, he said less than 400 microns but he said stage 3 and stage 4 hole yeah so stage 3 and stage 4 is larger than 400 micron so there is a, contra a contradictory uh, statement you have made okay number 2 is in very small holes even without ilm peeling it may close i mean uh, basically less than yeah very small uh, yeah. macular holes but interesting yeah. observation i mean it's a very interesting observation from the point of view of the temporal this thing but you have made a mistake on one side less than 400 on the other side you have written your patients were stage 3 and stage 4 So yeah that was group, just the the see, group, group should be consistently similar the variable should be only one if they, if you include stage 3 also 4 also and if you say whole say less than 400 less than 400 could mean anything starting from 100 to 200 to 300 then you have to do subgroup analysis that between 200 to 300 this was the issue between 300 to 400 this was the issue because if you say less than 400 this can cover anything from 100 to 400 yes and thank also stage 3 4 should be analyzed separately yes yes sir thank you thank, thank you, you thank you dr aman that was a good presentation you, and you dealt well
Our next Thank speaker you. is Dr. Uh, Mithun Tulsidas, and he would be presenting on comparison of 24-2 faster, fast, and standard programs of Swedish interactive threshold algorithms of Humphrey Field Analyzer for perimeter in patients with manifest and suspect glaucoma. Yes, I would be requesting Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Gopal Raju if they are there to comment on it. Thank you, ma'am. So, respected judges, panel, and viewers, good afternoon. Today, I'll be talking about my study that is comparison of 24 2 faster, fast, and standard programs in patients with manifest and suspect glaucoma. I have no financial interest. So, let's start with a brief introduction. The CETA program was developed in the 1990s and it took only half the time compared with the older strategies without any significant reduction in the accuracy. Gradually, it has become a gold standard. Currently, we have three CETA algorithms, CETA standard, fast, and faster. In faster, we have an additional 24-2C program also. The purpose of the study was to compare the visual field results obtained using the three algorithms. So this was a cross-sectional observational study. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Only reliable fields were considered for analysis, and the grading was based on Hoda, Parrish, and Anderson classification. These are the outcome parameters, which included all the parameters except the reliability indices. These are the statistical tests used. Results 70 eyes were included in the study, and these are the parameters which actually showed a significant difference. So when we compare between the algorithms, between CETA fast and standard, there was a difference only in test time. However, between faster and standard, there was a difference in test time, mean deviation, forbill threshold, and depress points with P less than 0.5 percentage. We have also compared the hemifield test and grading of the visual field where well, five cases were underestimated in CETA faster algorithm. These are the blank Altman plots for the major parameters and these plots confirm the same results. A poor agreement was visible for a few test points between fast and standard. To have a brief discussion, CETA standard was defined to replace the full threshold program and CETA fast to replace the fast pack. So initially though CETA fast was considered less precise, laser studies have shown that both are equally useful. So at the time of conducting our study, there were only two major studies on CETA faster, both in American Journal of Ophthalmology. So we are compared with those studies. In our study, the testing was shorter than fast and standard, and this could be due to only one reversal at primary test points with CETA faster. So it starts closer to the expected threshold in the primary points, and there is lack of blind spot check and false negative check. MD values were better with CETA faster, whereas between CETA fast and standard were almost identical. This was in contrast with the findings of Hale and Fuerta, this might be due to the variation in the steady population as we had an exclusive population of Indian origin with most of the cases falling under early glaucoma. This point towards the possibility of missing early cases of glaucoma as MD is still a classification criteria. Why is it the MD better with CETA faster? Maybe due to the age corrected normal threshold values that derived from CETA results in faster in contrast to CETA standard and fast. However, the PSD showed no statistical difference, which shows that the measurement variance may be the same, even if the sensitivities differ by a particular offset. BFI was similar, however, the mean formal threshold was higher, again, maybe due to less number of stimulus presentations. The uh, SFR actually identified less number of points with P less than 0.5 percentage, and five cases were underestimated. The blank Altman plots confirmed the same findings in contrast to the study by Hale et al. We had a limitation that we didn't check the repeatability on a long-term follow-up. To conclude, SFR showed significant difference in mean deviation, forward threshold, and points depressed P less than 0.5 percentage. Though some early glaucoma cases may be missed, saving considerable test time and showing similar VFI and PSD justify the use of SFR. However, it cannot replace CETA standard. Lastly, the algorithms cannot be used interchangeably on different test sessions for the same patient. Thank you for your kind attention and thank you ARC and AOS for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gopal Raju, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah, yeah. Nobody is there. Dr. Harsh. Okay, Mitun, that was very nicely done. And yes. uh, what exactly would you tell the people is the role of uh, the faster one in which you are actually having 24 dash with 2C? So 24-2C uh, is actually different from the 24-2 faster program because in 24-2C we have an additional 10 points in the central 10 degrees. So basically nowadays the early uh, recent literature shows that the retinal ganglion cells in the macula will be affected in early glaucoma also. So in cases where glaucoma suspects, it will be better if you have a new machine, if you have the 24-2C program, then you will 
to be able to detect even the central scotomas if there are any. So in 24-2, sometimes uh, it might be missed because uh, there are studies showing around 20 to 30 percentage may not show the scotoma in the central area in 24-2. So, so in such cases... Practice, for a practitioner, what do you recommend? What should they, what test should they do? So for a glaucoma suspect, that is we are not very much uh, uh, confirmed about the diagnosis if you are doubtful and it is a very... Uh, suspicious this, then I would prefer to do a 24-2C in a glaucoma suspect case. However, in a moderate or advanced glaucoma, that is if the patient has come to you with already significant thinning and optic exchanges where you know this is a clinical case of glaucoma, then maybe you can uh, uh, monitor the case with a CETA fast or any of the algorithms. Very good. And if you don't have the 2C machine? Which then CETA standard, sir. Yeah, plus which test? With 10-2 you, you can do. Very good. No. Excellent. Okay. Very, good. Yeah. Very good. I think we can go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Namrata, uh, who would be talking on evaluation of biomechanical properties of cornea using the ocular response analyzer in normal Indian population and its relationship with IOP and other ocular and general parameters. The judges uh, to comment would be Dr. Namrata Sharma and Dr. Bansal. Dr. Harsh, you stay with us. Can you share, Dr. Namrata? I was told Dr. Namrata had joined. Yes, ma'am. I saw her in the list of the panelists. Uh, why is she not connecting? She is right here, ma'am. Dr. Namrata Sharma. No, no, no. Not Namrata Sharma. Namrata was a speaker. Okay. Okay. We go on, I'm very sorry, we go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Lohit Rambharki, who would be presenting on comparative evaluation of retinal architectural changes using intraoperative microscope integrated IOCT in macular hole surgery, a prospective randomized trial. I would want Dr. Shobit and Dr. Malika to comment on this. Dr. Lohit. Um, not yes, ma'am. Uh, you could share your screen now. Yes, Dr. Lohit, you could start. Yes, Good afternoon, everyone. My, as ma'am told, my career is. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. I'm Dr. Lohit, um, Dr. Lohit, senior resident in the center. Um, uh, Comparative evaluation of retinal architectures using the micro uh, microscope integrated OCT macro hole surgery. Uh, it is an interaction is full thickness macro hole is defined as a four way with interaction of all retinal layers. The image is uh, shown. It is interrupted to OCT showing the. Can the, you speak a little louder, please? Image showing the interrupted. Can you? You're doing well. Interrupted to OCT image. Uh, is there some. Your signal is, is not good. Microscope also in the, in the no, uh, it is a left side is the image software image in the small image and the larger image intraoperative OCT. You can see the peering of the uh, element. Uh, the surgical procedure done was um, 23 gauge vitrectomy with PVD induction and BBG training with the uh, ILM with the BBG day and with after vitrectomy we have done the uh, SF surgical gas increase. Previous literature is in the Eller et al. In 2011, they have done the IOCT, but results are varying. The surgical feedback in facilitating surgical decision making. And Eller, in the another study, Robin et al., they have seen the use of intraoperative HD OCT as power changes in the retinal anatomy during macular surgery. The lacuna, no study has been done using the uh, CAD out using the microscopic integrated IOCT in quality to intraoperative or retinal changes in macular surgery. Our aim is uh, to find out these macular uh, and study the qualitative changes, retinal architecture changes in macular. Methodology, I have, it is a prospective randomized trial. 40 eyes are taken of stage 3 and stage 4. In the 20, out of 20, 40, 20 eyes are done with intra using intra OCT, IOCT with uh, inverted flap technique. Another is uh, without IOCT, conventional microscope. Sample size is 20 eyes in each group. I have done the RP center. Ethical clearance was obtained. This image showing the ethical clearance. 
and the inclusion criteria have included only the primary idiopathic macular holes with stage three, stage four, with pseudofect or uh, fake pseudofect, and uh, no relevant pathology like um, AMD was excluded. Uh, I have excluded the stage one and uh, stage two macular holes. It is a type one closure post up with without a foveal uh, defect. It's type two closure showing the image with the type defect and non closure. Outcome measures I have taken the primary outcome measure as by VCVA as null and chart, and second outcome measures whole closure by OCT and distance between the ellipsoid and RP band. Age distribution a uh, uh, match it and 63 mean was 63 in group one and group two 63.4. Both uh, in, the, in the analysis females uh, macro was more common in the females. So group one it is mean is seven, group two six, and duration of symptoms have matched like 6.5 in the group one, 7.2 in the macro index. 0.414 in group one and group two is 0.42. The least diameter is 498 microns in the group one. Group two is uh, 469. Macro closure types 17 was observed, uh, macro type one closure in the group one, and two was observed in the uh, group two. Uh, three was observed macro type two. While in group two, eight was eight was uh, type one closure, 12 was uh, type two closure. Macro by this is a chart showing the macro closure and uh, visual equity in the macro one uh, macro one um, uh, closure type one post of vision six months is uh, log more value 0.3 which is significant and that is a total analysis of the every parameter small diameter large diameter and uh, ellipsoid and rp distance band and visual equity comparison of group one and group two group one has a better visual equity and visual equity it is a log more chart and ellipsoid rp distance with visual equity ellipsoid rp distance in pre-op in the group one is 35.8 and post-op is a uh, 49.1 we have observed this and uh, uh, documentation of between the time and the relation between the time and the distance of the ellipsoid and rp band in the six after six months the um, distance between the ellipsoid band rp band is 49.1 micron it is a uh, uh, protocol and I mean, so this is a image showing the island peeling intraoperative image. After the island peeling, the flap, you can see the flap. It's the post op images. It is a result of the one patient uh, with pre op vision 6 by 16 snellens and post op 6 by 16. Complication 5 patients have prognosis of the head, prognosis to the nucleus closest. No retinal tear was observed. Summary statistically significant improvement is observed in type, uh, was observed at one month, six to three months six months post up in group one compared to group two. Conclusion, with inverted flap technique using IOCT, large macrons with the least diameter greater than 450 macrons, larger holes has better anatomic and closure outcomes. Recommendations, uh, we recommend using IOCT is better anatomical and uh, functional outcomes. I think, thank you, support, Professor Atikumar, for guide and IOS for this opportunity. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's a, a good study, uh, doctor. Good morning, uh, thank you, ma'am. But while you mentioned that the visual results and the structural results were better with the use of IOCT, yes, uh, you did not at all talk about how it helped with the surgical steps, like what exactly improved, which led to better results. Yes, um, in using the IOCT, we can um, mean, uh, manipulate the things like uh, while peeling uh, any subretinal fluid, we can also remove using it helps in the um, Removing the subretinal fluid. Apart from that, um, the flap is on the hole or not. We can observe using the IOCT, which actually helped in the early anatomical closure and better visual outcome. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. So that should also be a part of your presentation. That's right. That these are the benefits of using the IC, uh, right. IOCT, right. and a couple of videos to highlight that benefit. Right. Okay. Um, but in general, I mean, in macular hole. Possibly the IOCT may not be that much required in most of the cases, That's as right. in many other complicated cases where you have some macular hemorrhage or That's other right. lesions where you really need to see which are the layers. But, uh, yeah, this is a good study. Just try okay. to include the surgical steps. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Shobit is not, must be there. Dr. Shobit is not there. He should be there, I think. It's on the mute. Okay, then we. I think we actually just go and attend an emergency. So he asked me to just uh, mention that. Okay, so th then I'll ask another question. Yes. Uh, is this um, particularly significant only for the larger holes or is it applicable even to the stage one and stage two? The benefit of IOCT? We have done in the larger holes, ma'am. Um, but we using now we are doing smaller holes also. But uh, in the smaller also, um, better outcome in the uh, we can observe at the smaller operating time. 
we can smaller holes we can usually do it in a 10 minutes 12 minutes time so it can be a better uh, early visual recovery mm. but from the both uh, larger holes and smaller ones the procedure will be same mm. thank you uh, thank you very much that was a good presentation uh, i just wanted one in uh, uh, shika to know dr shika when the turn comes for dr niranjana's talk i would want you to comment on it it's a neuro ophthal topic you are connected no dr shika uh, Oh, yeah, okay. So we shall uh, now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Yash Gala, who would be presenting on the comparative study of smartphone-based applications for visual acuity with Snellen visual acuity charts. The judges here would be Dr. Sudhir and Dr. Arshad to comment on. So Dr. Yash, can you connect? You should share your screen. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the opportunity. Ma'am, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my title, uh, on the onset, I would like to thank AIOS and ERC for giving me this opportunity. So my title, my thesis topic is Comparative Study of Smartphone-Based Application for Visual Acuity with Snellen Visual Acuity. So community uh, vision screening plays a very important role in the detection of eye disease leading to early detection and prevention of potentially reversible causes of blindness. In recent years, the advent of mobile technology with the continuous hardware and software updates have meant that there have been plenty of healthcare applications with these products. Smartphone technology has been used to develop charts that can be used to record visual acuity. However, there are not many studies that evaluate the accuracy of a vision screening mobile application to measure. So in this study, the accuracy of application was evaluated. The application that we are using is the rapid eye sensitivity test to measure visual acuity. So the, my aim of the study is to establish clinical accuracy of the smartphone-based visual acuity with standard Snellen visual acuity chart. My objective is to assess the accuracy of the smartphone-based app a method of testing visual acuity as a tool in mass screening and clinical practice. My secondary objective would be to assess the app in different age group and also to assess the app for different visual acuity groups and the app at three meters and one meters distance. The material and method, so my inclusion criteria was of all patients coming to the OPD, including children who are cooperative and able to perform the test and visual acuity of 660 and more. Uh, Exclusion were all patients with any ocular pathology like any retinal pathologies or cataractous lens were excluded from the study or vision 660 or worse. Uh, so uh, normally any patient coming to the OPD, so these two were the tests which was done. The standard snail lens visual acuity LCD screen that was from the Appa Swami. I have no financial interest. And the app that we used was an Android-based smartphone application. All patients underwent visual acuity testing followed by a slit lamp and fundus evaluation. So this is the REST app. So this is how the application looks. These are the four options that was made. It was developed by Dr. Chan in collaboration with a software company. So how to use is the user manual where there is, uh, you can calibrate the size of the letter E for illiterates. It's a tumbling E which was used. You have to measure four centimeters with a ruler on the screen. So once you measure, irrespective of the screen and size, you have to measure four centimeter on any mobile. Once you do that, you click on the three meter side and as being unbiased, you have to just start uh, according to what the patient says in the direction in which the E is diverted. And as soon as he says that he can't read, there'll be a sound which says that uh, it is inaccurate and that, that is where the widget uh, stops. And that is the final recorded video. So the minimum, Sample was 500 patients, which was calculated assuming a mean difference of 0.1 log mark between the testing methods in at least 20% of the samples. So they were divided into two groups, 500 eyes for distance at one and at three meters. They were randomly divided. The study was approved by ethics committee at my tertiary hospital as per the declaration of health. So the statistical analysis uh, which were used was uh, the mean standard deviation with interquartal range, the chi-square test, the visual acuity was converted to log mark for purpose of statistical analysis. And the bland Elmont plants were used separately for the, uh, distance analyzer three and one. So we included 542 uh, patients in this study. The mean age was 40 plus or minus 17.2 years and the range was 62, six to 92 years. So uh, 
the second objective that we were clear on uh, dividing across the age group so there was no differences in visual acuity of left eye and for that matter right eye between snellens and smartphone and across age groups at 3 meters and across age groups at 1 meter uh, bland helmet plot showed uh, snellens chart so we studied the accuracy of the rest app to uh, record uh, visual acuity on a smartphone base the accuracy was slightly less with smartphone app pv at 3 meters we also performed testing of the rest app at different distances at 1 and 3 we did not find any significant uh, 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 any other study that compared the accuracy at different in, uh, distances we found that the app performed better at a distance of 1 meter than at 3 meters with differences of 0.2 logmar or 2 snellen lines the 95% agreement at 3 meters was similar in between both eyes but it was worse than when the visual acuity was more than 0.45 logmar and the limit of accuracy widened as the uh, visual acuity worsened that means at 3 meter it didn't show significant uh, combat so these were the four studies uh, this was the study on which my paper was based the doctor himself had published that he had used etdrs charger so the peak acuity test was one of the finest one where it was an african study where they used the even uh, uh, perception of light and counting fingers was assessed and it was fairly validated with a sample size of 300 to 400 the iphone study uh, elaborated 10 to 12 apps before this app was introduced and they didn't find any uh, significant role of those apps in uh, performing accuracy test so uh, so my conclusion is the rest app have a fair level of argument with the snellen chart at 1 meter based on a result we believe that the rest can be used as a quick screening tool while evaluating patients in outreach camps further studies are required with this approach to corroborate the results so just we to conclude ma'am uh, new technology should be studied with robust research methodology so their best applications can be discovered medical community should not allow convenience and affinity for new technology to trump the responsibility to collect accurate clinical data the principles governing healthcare protecting the patient should guide the development of these innovations thank you thank you dr sudhir yes yeah. yes uh... uh this was a excellently uh, done study and it is very apt currently what are the other applications of this uh, study can you apart from what you have done in the community setup can this be done in the current scenario so any other applications so this so basically sir this app was morely developed for the screening purposes the study which was originally done the doctor himself who used this collaboration he had done with a etdrs setting he, he so i am asking for other application other new applications in this current scenarios so there are many applications which are currently validated apart from the visual acuity test slide show ji hello yeah basically it is done in the current covid scenario for tele screening where the patients can be asked to do yes sir as a tool in telemedicine that can be used sir at all this other drawback you have found in this test it just only measures the size of the haptotype for calibration any other drawback which you have found in this yes sir the agreement why it is so good at 1 meter hello hello so can you hear me yes yes we can hear you but i think others have to be muted there's some background noise the room hall coordinator to look into it please hello yes you talk yeah. so, so, hello the i don't i keep everybody on mute the agreement was uh, better at 1 meter also because uh, many patients about the age group of 40 they may be myopic so the near vision would be better in those patients and uh, the optotype which is used is also small and at a distance of 1 meter so that can also be one of the possibilities why patient had a good uh, uh, vision uh, agreement at a distance of 1 meter but definitely as a screening tool where we go out for camps and it is at various situations like temple school or anyone by putting charts i think a mobile with a smartphone which everyone holds a sister or an optom or a doctor who is going i think this can be a very easy way and tested at 1 meter distance for screening purposes and trials for uh, other purposes uh, depending on the visual acuity to the main center thank you thank, thank, thank you, you. uh we shall now go on to our next speaker dr kanika bharatwaj who would be talking on characterization of in vitro grown corneal epithelial cells on polymer scaffold uh i would want dr mahipal to comment and dr kasturi to comment on this 
I hope you all are connected. Uh, Dr. Kanika? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Namrata, if you are connected, you could add your comments too. Yes, you could start your talk. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kanika, uh, and I did my DNB from IKRI Hospital, Noida. My thesis is basically a laboratory research in tissue engineering and corneal stem cell uh, research. So, corneal epithelium, we know, has a barrier function maintained by homeostasis, as suggested by Thorpe and Fron. But uh, there are some diseases where the limbal stem cell is not sufficient, and even keratoplasty and keratoprosthesis cannot help. In such uh, in such areas, tissue engineering is the future of corneal therapeutics. So we take a cell from the body, we isolate, we expand it outside the body using scaffolds and growth factors and implant it back. This is what tissue engineering is. There can be two types of scaffolds. They can be natural sourced or they can be synthetic. Natural sourced, such as amniotic membrane, they have been used in past, but they have their own issues of infection and processing. Whereas synthetic ones are easier to handle and can be made into desired properties. So the objective of my study was to evaluate the uh, cell growth and characterize them and also to assess suitability of the scaffold. We use these following materials and it was a study conducted from October 2017 to December 2019, experimental and observational study. It was conducted at my parent institute, IKRI Hospital, and also in association and collaboration with National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi. So first we formulated the microparticles, then we uh, formulated scaffold from them, and then we uh, did the study of the scaffolds and particles. And after that, we did in vitro corneal epithelial cell culture, and then we started growing these cells on the scaffolds and studied them. So this was the formulation of microparticles using double emulsion solvent evaporation technique. The organic phase comp comprised of two different ratios of uh, polymers, PDLLA, poly DL lactic acid, which is commonly used in sutures, and eutrogit, which is a cationic polymer. After the uh, microparticles were formed, we could easily fuse them using methanol at room temperature and we could uh, uh, get desired say, uh, shy, uh, size and shape uh, scaffolds. We then went on to do physiochemical property studies. We did corneal epithelial cell culture using uh, laboratory grown rabbit corneal stem cell lines like uh, SIRC and appropriate medium was maintained and cell culture method was uh, performed. Then we seeded the cells. We also tried to do a primary corneal epithelial cell culture from mice. So we took bulb C mice, which were four to six weeks age and accord in accordance with the ethical guidelines. And we enucleated their globes and took the corneal button, including limbus tissue and grew them specifically. So this was a complete growth media that we used. Then we did the cell proliferation studies using MTTSA and live dead cell assay. Coming to my results, so the polymer microparticles that we formed, we could see that they were stable spherical and the heterogeneity in size was increased as the eutrogit concentration was increased. Same was confirmed on scanning electron microscopy also. The size distribution of the particles was in the micro range and they were uniformly distributed. But with the eutrogit, the size, initial, in, uh, size was smaller. Coming to the scaffold, so on scanning electron microscopy of the scaffolds, we could see that they were porous structure, which is good for cell growth. And the porosity index was also measured. Out of the scaffolds that we saw, uh, 70s to 30 combination ratio showed the best porosity, and porosity is necessary for a diffusion of nutrients. Uh, cell surface charge is uh, uh, negative, so it needs a positive surface to adhere. So addition of eutrogit to the PDLLA actually increased the surface charge and gave to better cell adhesion. SIRC cell culture also showed the same, and we could uh, uh, see the growth of, uh, from day one to day th uh, five increasing, and 70s to 31 showed the best. So uh, we also tried corneal tissue explant, but uh, because of the time constraints, we could not complete. I would conclude that stable particles can be formed in a uh, ratio of 90, 10, and 70, 30, and these can be fused into desirable scaffolds, and these can be uh, good for cell growth. So limitations were time constraints. And in future, I recommend using better uh, species. These were my references. And I would like to thank my mentors, my guide, and co-guide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaniga, Dr. Kasturi, Dr. Mahipal. Uh, it's a very nice presentation on basic research. And there okay. has been, uh, for more, I have seen also some publications there. Recently, also, there was a publication where they have used the same material as a synthetic material as a scaffold. And they have found very promising result of the synthetic uh, alternative to the donor tissue. Uh, 
Yes. And most of the results, all the previous results that they were doing, that they have shown a combination regarding the porosity that you have mentioned, that a 50-50 is the best. But in your study, you have shown the porosity of 70 is to 30 is the best. So why do you feel that this higher difference is better porosity as compared to the previous studies? Ma'am, our previous studies have used different copolymers. And as far as we have did the literature search, uh, the Utrajit polymer has not been used. They have used other like PLGA has been used, cellulose has been used. But with Utrajit, they did not use. So I think because of the difference of the cationic polymer, I think in our study, the 70s to 30s scaffold showed better results. Okay. And any way of optimization of the subcultures? Ma'am, we tried, but the primary corneal epithelial cell culture is a very delicate process and it needs a lot of time. And also our sample, that is, we were uh, ethically approved for mice cornea, so those are very small. So in future, we do uh, suggest that a better source of the stem cells, like a bigger cornea and limbal tissue from rabbit, maybe if it is ethically improved, that would give a better source and that can be optimized. But with the mice cornea, we could not because of the time constraints. Dr. Mahipal, can you add anything? Yeah, so Dr. Kanika, uh, yes, good presentation. Uh, how you, do you sir. think uh, it adds to what is there in the literature and um, uh, how far are you from uh, clinical application of any significance uh, with your study? Sir, uh, the thing that we add here is that uh, all the other studies and artificial scaffolds, they need a lot of uh, processing in very high-end laboratories. So the polymer that I mentioned, sir, this can, once the microparticles are formed, which only need two or three steps in a normal lab, any product development lab, once the particles we have, we can fuse them easily using methanol, even at room temperature. So various centers, if, if in future this uh, goes into transplantation and other techniques, they can themselves form the scaffolds of their desired shape and size according to the corneas. Also, sir, uh, we are really very far from clinical applications. This was just an initial uh, process that we started in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahipal and uh, Dr. Kasuri. We shall go on to our last speaker because we're short of time. Dr. Niranjana Bala Subramaniam, she would be presenting on the pattern of visual impairment in a spectrum of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I would request Dr. Shikha to make her comments at the end of it. I think Dr. Santosh is not here. You could share your screen. A very good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Your signal is not okay. Maybe you could switch off your video. Yes. Share your screen. I'm sorry. I can start here. A very good afternoon, everyone. My yeah. presentation is on the pattern of visual impairment and spectrum of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And I extend my sincere thanks to my professors. HIE is an important cause of permanent damage to neural tissues resulting in neonatal mortality or manifest with permanent neurodevelopmental abnormalities. We all know the common ocular manifestations in HIE. On a detailed literature review, we found that there is no study so far which has evaluated the interrelationship between the visual impairment, clinical neurological severity, the neuroimaging severity, and the entire spectrum of the perinatal HIE, and also the impact of visual impairment on the social development of these children. Hence, we arrived at the objectives, the primary objective being to evaluate the relationship between the visual acuity and the clinical severity of the HIE. A prospective observational study was conducted with sample size of 60 diagnosed cases with 20 in each of the three clinical stages of severity, included children between six months and five years of age and excluded other acquired encephalopathies, a detailed ocular examination, pediatric neurological workup, and the social developmental quotient assessed by VSMS by neuropsychologists and all those children who had neonatal MRI were subjected to MRI grading. Binocular visual acuity with Teller and Cardiff acuity after cycloplegic refraction was tested and flash VEP was recorded. And the clinical severity was classified as per standard clinical staging of HI into three stages. And the lesions in the MRI were topographically classified, scored, and graded. And briefing on the results, we found that nearly 78% of the study population had a history of term gestation and birth weight did not have a significant influence on the clinical severity of HIE. 
and a primary objective of visual acuity assessed by Taylor in Cardiff Acuity Cards had a statistically significant relationship with the clinical severity of the HI. And there was no significant difference in the acuity levels between term and preterm children of HI. And the refractive error was comparable across the clinical stages. And we found a good correlation between TEL and Cardiff acuity in these children. And comparing them with the creating acuity and the Cardiff acuity with the normative data, we found that the, our study population were far lesser compared to the standard normative data. And the flash VEP recordings of these children did not have a significant relationship with the clinical staging of the disease. And we found nearly 80% in stage two and three had a significant evidence of disc failure. And the frequency of nystagmus was almost similar and lesser in stage uh, two and three. And we found that the convergence strabismus was the predominant one with nearly 53% in the study group having esotropias. And there was a good correlation between the MRI scoring and the Teller and Cardiff acuity. And also found a significant relationship between the MRI scoring and the clinical severity of the disease. And the visual acuity had a significant impact on the social development of these children. And as expected, the systemic morbidities were higher in stages two and three. On summarizing the results, I would say that HIE was more in term gestation in our study population. And there was no significant difference in acuity levels between term and preterm. And the acuity impairment was lesser in stage one of disease. There was good correlation between Taylor and Cardiff acuity and also with the MRE scoring. And the refractive error was similar in, across the clinical stages. And Ooh. convergence turbulence was the predominant one. And I would like to recommend that we need a large scale follow up studies to correlate the predictive role of neonatal imaging on the future visual outcome in the perinatal HI. And we need to focus on tailoring the services according to the severity of the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shika, you can take one small comment. Yeah, Dr. yeah, yeah it's a good study. Uh, you did mention that uh, the brain injury did not correlate with the VEP. Do you have any explanation for that? And it is felt in most of the studies that injuries with anterior visual pathway impairment had relationship in the visual evoke potentials, whereas we see in uh, HI, both in term and preterm, the ischemic insult is more concentrated in the retrochiasmatic pathways. So that might also play a role. And mostly, like most of the studies had pattern VEP or sweep VEP results. So we sh uh, the inclusion of flash VEP was not more relevant. We found it difficult to do pattern VEP and sweep VEP in these children. Yeah. So if you... So consideration should be given to that. Yeah, no, that's not what I was asking. Of late, very recently, they've started looking at, you know, the same ischemia can damage the retina also. So now they are evaluating whether it is the, the vision loss. In certain cases, it's because of the retinal damage. So, you know, in those cases uh, where the retina is damaged, the ERG is, you know, giving more information than VEP. Anyway, good study. Thank you very much. I think you all could all to make your total and... Uh forward the Google Forms. And uh, on behalf of ARC, I really want to thank all the dignitaries on the dais, great set of judges and excellent uh, presentations of the 12 PG thesis awardees. Every single speaker did a very good job and uh, truly impressed all of us with your commitment and sincerity. All the best to you all and congratulations in advance. You would be updated about the final results. Thank you very much. Thank you one and all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.